Okay. Before I get started, are there any questions? Anything that you want to discuss? Anything? So everything is clear. You are confident. Now you can set up a SWOT model and excellent. So as I understand, some of you are interested in the water quality because we haven't discussed about water quality much through this uh, presentation or through this uh, past three, four days. So I'll make a small presentation about uh, phosphorus, but you can think about nitrogen or pesticides or bacteria, anything, any water quality or sediment. This is both sediment and phosphorus, actually. So this is what I'm going to talk about is the cost-effective way to do the best management practices because uh, always the resources are limited, how much funds you have to clean up any problem you have in a watershed. So this is a watershed called Cedar Creek in Texas. And this supplies, so here is the lake. This supplies water for about uh, 2.5 million people near Dallas and Fort Worth. Okay, and uh, it's primarily there are two major rivers, not rivers, small uh, uh, creeks flowing into this lake. One's called Kings Creek, another's called Cedar Creek, and that's a rough um, size of the watershed. And this is the total size of the watershed. So that's about 2,500 square kilometer, okay, 2,500 square kilometer watershed. And these are all that's draining directly to the lake, actually. Okay. So this is the land use distribution. As you can see, most of them are pasture or hay. Okay. So in the pasture land, you have a lot of animals in the watershed. Okay. But it's dominated by pasture. So if I go to the next slide, you'll see that's almost um, okay. So the pasture or hay, you can see the yellow color. That's almost about um, sixty-four percent of the watershed is pasture or hay. Okay. The cropland is only six percent. The urban land is also six percent. So the crop and urban lands are only 6%, whereas grassland or pasture land is about 64% in this watershed. Okay? And this is the distribution by creek, the Cedar Creek, the Kings Creek, and other basins. So this is the distribution by the individual major river flowing into the lake. Okay, again, urban is about Six or seven percent, cropland is six percent, grassland or sorry, pasture and hay is about sixty plus percent. Okay. Any questions so far? And this is the um, wastewater treatment plants. Okay. So there are quite a few wastewater treatment plants here actually. All this plus sign, they are all wastewater coming from cities, industries, okay, things like that. And uh, you can see there are a lot of them right close to the lake also, okay. And here is the gauge data from the USGS, okay. This is, this is one gauge data and this is another gauge data. This is for the Cedar Creek and this is for the Kings Creek. So we have only two gauges in this watershed above the lake. Then we also have a lake model called WASP. So WASP is a lake water quality model. So the SWOT output is feed into the WASP to look at the lake water quality. Because the idea here is to keep the lake clean for drinking water supply. Because of the phosphorus, they are getting a lot of algae 
that algae creates a smell order, okay? That order creates problem for people. So it's sometimes these algaes are so small, they go and clog pipes, okay? So they have to clean them up on a regular basis, actually. Because this watershed is downstream of the city, Dallas and Fort Worth. They have to pump the water for nearly 80 miles. I mean, 80 miles means around 120 kilometers. They have to pump the water from downstream to supply the cities, actually. Okay? So if there is a lot of clogging, a lot of friction, so they need more horsepower to pump the water. So there is a lot of practical difficulties in supplying the water if the phosphorus continue to increase in this watershed, actually. So the first thing we did was we set up the SWOT model based on the subbasins here, based on the land use and the soils, the point sources, and so on. And then we calibrated the model. Okay, this is the calibration for a long term, actually. You can see the, this goes from 1966 to almost 1990, actually, 35 plus years, actually. And we have another model from 1990 to 2015 or so. So you can see the long-term mean, the R-square and nash Cliff, they are all very decent, actually. So this is for one gauge in the Kings Creek, okay? So this is the creek right here. This is the gauge right there, actually. And then there is another gauge. So this is the other gauge in the Cedar Creek. Okay, again, the statistics are very decent, very good for the same time period. If you have any questions, please stop, actually. Then we also had another source of gauge from 1990 to 2000, sorry, 1980 to 2002. This is the radar-based rainfall, okay? Because in, in the 80s and 90s, we, don't, we did not have any radars. So the radar came only after 1990, actually, okay? So we also used radar is spatially distributed much more fine scale compared to gauge data, the rainfall gauge data that may be only about six or seven in the watershed, whereas radar is spatially distributed. So we also use that data to improve the calibration so that we can account for the spatial variability of your rainfall within the watershed, okay? So that's what this calibration, again, it's, it's decent. You, if you look at this value, look at the average rainfall is 18 cubic meter per second, right? If I go back, it's only three cubic feet per second. So there is a drastic change in the amount of rainfall or the stream flow before and after, before 1990 and after 1990, okay? So something like three or four was a 16 or 18 now, actually. So you're talking about a significant, almost 400 to 500 percent more stream flow in the last 30 years than the previous 30 years. Yesterday, I showed you my slide, one of the other slides. They're also the same picture, OK? So in Texas, we are experiencing more rain in the last 20 years or 30 years than the previous 30 years, OK? Then the water agency who manages the water of the lake, they have water quality sample for nearly 20 years, actually. It is not a daily sample or monthly sample. This is what we call grab sample. So they go routinely every three months or every two months, they go and collect samples from the, water, from the, from the river. So these are all the various locations. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten locations throughout the watershed. They collect samples. Okay. So this is for nitrogen and this is for phosphorus. Okay. So this is observed. This is modeled by SWOT. Okay. Again, because they are not continuous measurement, we cannot plot them, okay? They are one day here, one day there, and things like that. So 
we just do a box plot of making sure the observation and prediction is in the same range, actually. So that's what you are seeing. The nitrogen and phosphorus are within the same range. Statistically, they are in the same range, actually. Okay. So this is for nitrogen attached to sediment, organic nitrogen. This is organic phosphorus, phosphorus attached to sediment, again. Okay. So this is going from upstream to the downstream. Okay. And this is nitrate, the soluble nitrogen, the soluble phosphorus. Look at the magnitude here, it's in concentration. If you look at this one, this is in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whereas with sediment, it's also 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, but it's predominantly in a higher order, above 0.2. Okay, whereas the soluble is below 0.1, most of them. So there is almost 200 to 300 percent difference between soluble and sediment, phosphorus. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So this, finally, this is the total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So when I say total nitrogen, that is both organics, the attached to sediment, and soluble. Same thing, phosphorus attached to sediment and soluble phosphorus, both put together. Okay. So this gives you, start to give you an idea where exactly the load is high, which river, spatially, the load is coming very high, actually. So if you want to invest in any implementation plan, what, what place to implement, actually, where to implement, okay? How much to find resources to find? SWOT is going to give you the same information. That's what they are really interested in is identifying where, where to put the best management practices if you have a limited dollars for implementation, okay? So this involves both economic model and water quality model. And then there is a lake model, actually. So there are three models are working together here to come up with a solution. Then there is always two, two uh, information or two uh, sources that you should consider when you're looking at water quality. Okay? In water quantity, it is always the landscape, okay? Rain, runoff, okay? The river is just a media to carry that forward, actually, okay? The river role is somewhat limited in the stream flow process, okay? Unless otherwise there is a water coming from the ground, groundwater side, actually. Otherwise, the river process is somewhat limited. Whereas in water quality, river plays a major role, okay? So you, you could have sediment coming from the landscape. You can also have sediment coming from the channel. You can have sediment coming from the, uh, sorry, nitrogen and phosphorus and pesticide coming from the landscape. And that nitrogen phosphorus can settle, can, can be put on the sediment, along with the sediment in the, land, in the river, and that can carry, that can stay there for a long time. Okay? So the sediment can be a sink, Sorry, the river can be a sink or a source. Sink means deposition. Source means contribution. Okay? So in this graph, what we are trying to show you is this is the, what is applied and what is um, um, what is the atmospheric source, actually. So this is how much fertilizer we apply. Remember that it's only 6% of the watershed is agriculture, right? That's the only place where you apply fertilizer. It's not in, the, in your pasture land or in your uh, uh, pasture land. They get manure, not fertilizer, manure from the animals. So that is also calculated by the model, actually. Okay? So this is how much is applied. Okay? So this is how much is at the watershed outlet. 
and this is how much, uh, sorry, this is how much at the outlet, this is how much leaving from the field actually. Okay? Oh, no, no, uh, just take me back. The nitrogen applied is this one, sorry. This is what is applied, and this is what is leaving the field, and this is what is reaching the watershed outlet. Okay? So, almost 74% of what's coming from the field is reaching the lake. So, there is about 26% is either getting deposited in the channel or because of the algae, because of the biological activities, some of those is transformation, transformed from nitrogen to algae. Okay? So this is for the Kings Creek, and this is for the, sorry, this is for the Kings Creek, and this is for the Cedar Creek. So you can see, relatively speaking, Cedar Creek produces more than the Kings Creek. Okay? And this is the rest of the watershed. Okay? The one that's very close to the lake, directly contributing to the lake, actually. So again, SWAT would be able to show, partition the source, what's leaving from the landscape, and what's the contribution from the channel. So that you want to look at to see, if you want to invest, should I invest it in the channel, or should I invest it in the landscape? If you want to invest in the landscape, which creek should I target, actually? Within that creek, which landscape I should target. So you can be as specific as you want with just one measurement in the watershed, actually. One or two measurements. Okay? So that's where the strength of model like SWAT is to understand and identify the potential risk or potential landscape that you should treat it, actually. Because measuring at one location in the river, we don't know where it is coming from the, from the landscape, actually. That can be only done through modeling. Unless otherwise you go and measure every place, which is not possible, actually. Okay? So that's where the modeling strength, real strength of the model is, identifying the spatial pattern or the spatial distribution of where the source of your pollution coming from. Okay? So that's what I wanted to communicate here, actually. If you have questions, please jump in. So again, here is how much fertilizer applied. So you can see King's Creek, 45% of the fertilizer in King's Creek, 38%, sorry, 17% in cedar, and about 38% in other watershed. And this is for phosphorus. Okay, this is how much was applied, actually. Then, if you look at it here, how much is the cropland and how much is the urban in the entire watershed? Okay. In terms of nitrogen applied, actually, I think it's wrong here. It should be other way around. The crop. This should be the cropland. You are not going to apply much. We we do apply fertilizer in the urban for the landscape to keep the grass green. There is some amount of uh, fertilizer application. So, but that's relatively small compared to agricultural land. Okay. So again, spatially, you can look at the same thing. Where, di where did you apply the nitrogen? Okay. So this is in percentage of the total applied. Where, where are the mostly agricultural dominated subbasin, and how much you applied there actually? So this shows you from this model how much of nitrogen coming from the landscape, from the different landscape. So this is by the different creeks, Kings Creek, Cedar Creek, and other, other watersheds. This is the total. So if you look at it here, the cropland produces almost 56% of your nitrogen load, actually. So only 6% of the land produces 56% of the load going into the lake. And if you look at the urban, it's 6% of the land produces almost 16 or 17% of your load. This is the grassland, pasture land, so which is 64% is producing almost 23% of the load actually. 
Okay? So if you want to tackle your problem, it's right here. Urban and agriculture are the only two big sources. You can treat here, but you're not going to reduce significantly. Okay? The land is very, very big, but the contribution is relatively small. Okay? So the, big, the maximum reduction that you can expect is from agriculture and uh, and uh, urban landscapes. Okay, so here also it gives you how much nitrogen is leaving the field. Previously I showed you how much was applied and this shows you how much is leaving from that field actually or from that sub watershed. Okay. I can go through the same thing for phosphorus. This is for phosphorus. Okay. In phosphorus, you could see that only 40% is reaching the watershed outlet. There is a lot of settlement in the channel. Okay. So this is how much is leaving the field, but only 40% of that is reaching the lake. Okay. Because there is also a lot of small, small ponds that may able to absorb a lot of the sediment in their ponds, actually. In the interest of the time, I'm going to skip one or two slides here. Again, this shows you where the phosphorus was applied. Okay? And here it shows you the cropland produces almost 50% of your phosphorus load, and the urban produces almost 30% of your phosphorus load. So again, the most dominant sources here for phosphorus is also agriculture and urban landscapes. And the, if you want to look at that in a spatial pattern, you can see where the phosphorus is coming from, from the landscape. So all these things are all through modeling, actually. Once the model is calibrated, verified, now you can start looking at the spatial pattern of where the sources and where the contribution and how many how much of that is reaching the watershed outlet yes eh eu queria eh entender um pouco mais eh se ele tinha se o grupo tinha características eh do lago né a jusante E, por exemplo, o SWOT considera, ele considerou fósforo total e nitrogênio total, mas poderia considerar as frações orgânica e inorgânica. E é, se isso foi levado em conta depois na discussão do, dos resultados, para perceber que jeito era o nível trófico nesse reservatório, se é, eles não quiseram considerar realmente a fração orgânica para ver qual era a produtividade que estava tendo lá. Mas nesse sentido, sim. Tá. So let me ask you. Mm -hmm. um, a primeira era relacionada a. a é, se o, ele pode, pode considerar as frações separadamente, orgânica e inorgânica. Okay. So she's asking if you could consider the organic and inorganic fractions from nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah. Or if you did there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly. So when you apply the fertilizer, it can be manure. Mm -hmm. Or it could be fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. That chemical fertilizer goes into the soil and the plant grows. When the plant grows, after you harvest the crop, the remaining residue, okay, the, the stock above the ground, is goes back into the soil and that becomes residue that changes into nitrogen and phosphorus. The, those are all organic nitrogen and organic phosphorus. Okay, so you may apply only fertilizer to grow the plant, but eventually that get converted into organic form. So when we do the calculations, it's done in separate, one for organic, one for uh, soluble, dissolved. Then once it comes to the river, we again keep track of what is sol soluble and what is dissolved or what is organic. And then we keep track of the same thing. For final analysis, we combine them to present the results. But we can do all the analysis just for organic, just for um, uh, soluble, if you want to do that, actually. Then the analysis, I mean, the, the presentation will get even longer, actually. So I'm trying to reduce 
the slide to show you a lot of the combined. But when we did the calibration, we did it for specifically for organic and specifically for soluble. Que a importância de entender também essa fração orgânica, que é a contribuição que está chegando no reservatório. E aí eu queria saber, quer dizer, não é um reservatório, é um lago. Eu queria entender se lá tem é, problema de eutrofização, de fato. Mm -hmm. So she's asking if in the lake and the reservoir you have uh, eutrophization, uh, yeah, eutrophication problems. Yeah, eutrophication. Yeah. Sorry, uh, problems and right. it, how you could account for that there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The main reason we started this project is uh, because of the eutrophication and because of the uh, odor, the smell. Okay, the water smell is starting to change. So the water supply company is concerned that they won't be able to sell the water because they have to treat it. And the treatment cost per day is about a million dollars. Okay? So they want to reduce the cost. Of, so the treatment company is willing to pay the farmers to reduce the pollution coming from the field. So this is where the pollution trading comes, actually. So instead of them treating it and then supplying to the, your tap in the house, they want to treat it at the source. Mm -hmm. They want to reduce it at the source. Okay? This did not happen one or two years. This is happening for the last 50 to 60 years. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the accumulation of all this small dose or small amount over a period of time is now catching up and now that becoming a major problem for the lake. So when we did the analysis on the lake, in order to reverse the trend, it will take another about 40 to 50 years. It's not going to solve. You're not going to solve that problem. Even if you stop all the sediment, all the nitrogen, and all the phosphorus going into the lake, the amount of storage already in the lake is going to take another 30 to 40 years to change the course, So, which is not practical to not to uh, have, because if you're going to stop it, you're not going to bring the water either. So, it's not practical. So what we are trying to do here is we ran the lake water quality model and we set the target. What should be a practical and meaningful reduction of nitrogen and phosphorus from the landscape so that over the next 100 years, whether we can stabilize or reverse the trend in this lake, actually. Okay. So once the lake becomes saturated, you can't do anything about it, okay? You cannot clean the lake at a, unless you completely remove the bottom sediment and uh, stop the water coming in and then remove the entire sediment and uh, I, nobody will buy, uh, take that sediment actually. We have a lot of problems like that because there are a lot of lakes, they want to completely break the lake actually. They don't want the dam anymore because it's, it's saturated its capacity. But environmental concerns will not allow anybody to do that because they don't know where to put the sediment. Nobody will buy the sediment or nobody will allow to put it in the landfill because it's got a lot of metals, a lot of organic materials. Nobody wants to touch that, actually. So it is a major problem, environmental problem. É, porque eu fiquei pensando justamente isso, porque a maior parte da contribuição vem das áreas agrícolas, e aí é difícil pensar assim num controle, né? Talvez uhum. pensar e a gente pensa mesmo em cenários aí que de mudanças que poderiam ser feitas que melhorassem, mas na prática é difícil pensar. Sim, é, exatamente. Tá bom, obrigada. Mas você entendeu né, bem que eles, a, todo o problema veio exatamente pela eutrofização né, do reservatório, que tinha então muita alga e aí mau cheiro e problemas aí para todo o tratamento de água para abastecimento público. Né? Então eles fizeram tudo isso nesse, nesse objetivo. Né? E aí o que eles descobriram aqui é como todo esse processo vem acontecendo nos últimos diversos anos, mesmo se parasse toda a produção agora, demoraria mais de 30 anos para reverter um processo no, nos lagos. Né? E, 
E não foi o que ele falou, não é prático isso. Ninguém vai parar de produzir né, determinadamente. No entanto, você pode pensar em cenários de uh, para reverter isso, que é o que eles fizeram no fim. Tipo, nos próximos 100 anos, o que, que poderia ser feito para reduzir essas condições e melhorar a qualidade assim, né, a longo prazo? Porque isso tem um custo no fim, né, que é o custo de tratamento de água, que é altíssimo, e você está poluindo ali. Né? Então, como reduzir a fonte de poluição, de repente, na agricultura, na parte urbana, para que isso melhore ao longo do tempo. Ah, ok. She's asking uh, for the lake. Is it um, the only use for water supply, or do they yeah. have other uses for yeah, the? No, no electricity, no, no power okay. generation, just pure water supply. Mm -hmm. That's it. Questions? He has one here. Yeah. What minimum data you need to have a satisfactory mo like, um, model for this, for water quality? I mean, there is no amount of current data that is being collected is going to be enough. I can tell you that. Because we can't go back in time collect data, right? So it only moving forward. So that's why. We also use the same model to inform water agencies where to collect data, when to collect data, how often to collect data, and what data to be collected. Because water quality data is very expensive in collecting, analyzing, especially if it is bacteria or pesticide, it's even three, four, ten times more expensive. Okay? So a lot of the places we go and collect data without even doing any analysis. Okay? So that data may, may or may, ha, may not have any value. So that's where models can be used to inform the organization that's collecting the data so that are they collecting the right location? Are they collecting the right parameters? What are, so right now, if I have a, this is my problem, if I'm collecting the data right here, what good it is actually, right? So that's where you need to be thinking about. So, If you want to talk about whether the data currently we have is sufficient, no, it's not sufficient. But that is the best we have. So we use that data to do the calibration we can do to do the, explain the problem. But at least moving forward, we can collectively decide, okay, instead of having the gauge here, let's move it here. Or let's move it here. And then do the analysis. So it needs to be a continuous process. It can't be just one time. You analyze it and then walk away, actually. It needs to be, a, you have to evaluate this data all the time and make adjustment until you are satisfied with the information you are gathering. But as of uh, land use data, like you mm -hmm. need to know uh, what kind of crops are growing? Yes, the you do. You do have to because especially for water quality is very important. It's not only what crops you are growing, what fertilizer, what kind of fertilizer you are applying between organic versus inorganic, like manure versus, within manure, There is also liquid manure, there is solid manure. Because if you apply liquid manure, it's available in the same year. If you apply solid manure, it may take six to nine months for that fertilizer to become available. Okay? So the type of fertilizer, the amount of fertilizer, the timing of fertilizer is very important. Okay? Then you also need to know about the management. How do you till the land? Did you till across the slope or along the slope? Okay? So there are lots of information on agriculture. You do need them. I mean, you don't need them by every farmer by farmer. Collectively, what is the general practice in this region? And try to represent that, actually. So if, if I'm running a model from 1960, I, I certainly don't have data for 1960. Okay, what were they growing in each field or what management practices? So you have to make some adjustment. And there is uncertainty in a lot of those inputs. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Good. The next is sediment. So this is the amount of sediment, what's coming from the channel. The channel is contributing almost 20% of the sediment, and the remaining 80% is coming from the landscape in the Cedar Creek. In the Kings Creek, it's almost 37% is coming from the channel, and for, um, 48% is coming from the landscape. Okay. 
So you can portion out again, the sediment is two sources, landscape and channel, two different sources. So again, this is the sediment loading from the non-point sources. So if you look at it, the cropland produces almost 70% of their sediment coming from. Then the urban produces about 14%. Okay. And if you want to look at the, where the source is coming from, these are all the sub-basin where the, most of the sediment is coming from, the top sediment coming from these sources, actually. So if you want to make any recommendation for your BMP, this is the most applicable, or appropriate places to do that. And this is where the channel erosion is happening. So the previous one is the landscape erosion, and this is the channel erosion. Does that make sense so far? So the next is the target. OK, we, we ran the model from the, the WASP model in the lake, and the lake modeler told us that we need to reduce the amount of phosphorus going into the lake by 35%. Because they, they think 35% is reasonable, the expectation. Okay? If you ask for 50%, 70% reduction, it's not going to happen. So there's no point in a, putting some goal that is not achievable. So let's say if you want to reduce 35%, uh, sorry, three, uh, the, uh, here it is, 35% total phosphorus reduction, you have to reduce, the, this is the baseline, over a 30 or 7 years, this is the amount of total phosphorus coming to the lake every year. Okay, you have to reduce this by 35%. So that's the goal. This is how much sediment, and this is how much nitrogen. Okay. So we consider several different BMPs, best management practices. So filter strips around the field, grass. Uh, great stabilization structures along the channel, grass waterways along the channel, terraces, conservation, tillage, and prescribed grazing, meaning limit the number of animals in the landscape, for example. Okay? So these are all the practices planned, and this is what parameters we had to adjust in SWAT to achieve those plan, uh, practices. Okay? So if, in order to reach the 35% goal, okay, if I apply filter strip 15 meters width in every eligible land, only for agriculture land, not all landscape, only agriculture land, it can reduce your phosphorus by 30%. If I apply the grade stabilization structure only where it is applicable, it can reduce only 2.3% of phosphorus. Okay? So we went through all the different practices and tried to identify what, which are the ones will give the most reduction. But we also know for each of them how much it's going to cost. Okay? So the grade stabilization may cost more, but it's going to give me only 2% reduction. Should I invest in this or not? Okay? So this is where the economic economist came into play and they run their model, optimization model, and they came back and gave us a recommendation of, okay, implement only 30% filter strips, 40% um, conservation tillage, things like that. So they, give us, they gave us the different um, uh, distribution of what is possible for given the money and the resources and time to do that. Because each one has got different timeline to achieve your goal. They are not going to achieve in the same year, actually. Some may take two, three, four, five years before you can see the benefit. Okay? It's not going to be seen immediately on year one. Okay? So we selected seven. I mean, we tried about 15 or 17 different BMPs, and we finally settled for only seven of them is most effective here. So those seven BMPs, or this. So this is the final results from the economic analysis. They said apply filter strip 50% of the eligible land, grade stabilization structure 100%, the 
channel, uh, the critical pasture planting is 20%, terrace is 15%, wastewater treatment plant is 100%, reduction meaning filtering. Okay. Conversion of cropland to grassland may be 20%, prescribed grazing 15 and to achieve a total reduction of 35% at the watershed outlet. Okay. It's not only what's happening in the landscape, we need to see the results at the watershed outlet at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, by conversion of croplands to grass, it can be equal to reduction a scenario including fertilizer reduction? Yeah. Yeah, ob I obviously. Mean, yeah? Yeah, if we need to convert the land. We cannot have, for example, a scenario including 30% of fertilizer reduction while keeping the yield crop productivity the same. I mean, you can aim for that also, actually, but that's not practical. Because you can aim. Farmers are going to apply more than what the plant required. Yeah. They can't just put amount. So let's say the plant requires 120 kilograms of nitrogen. Farmers are always going to put about 150 because they know that something is going to get lost either through leaching or through surface runoff or sediment, whatever. Yeah, so for example, if we say we're going to use the slow release fertilizer, yeah. then what in the first, the in SWAT it's possible? No, it's not possible yet, actually. But let's say we, even if you consider that, I'm talking about practical sense, actually. Even if you apply slow release, it's going to attach to water and sediment. Yeah, you are yeah. going to lose. I mean, you may release the, uh, if it is stays in the soil, then yes. But if it is applied in the surface, it's going to go through that actually. So that's why people now use what we call knife in. We don't apply fertilizer anymore on the surface. We directly apply in the root zone. Yeah. Okay. About maybe about um, five to ten centimeters below the ground. Okay. So that the fertilizer stays in the soil. It, now, it doesn't move because if it is surface, then only the runoff and sediment can take it, actually. So we do what we call knife in, meaning underneath your plow, we put the fertilizer and then inject the fertilizer, liquid fertilizer. No more solid fertilizer, actually. So we apply a liquid fertilizer, thereby it stays in the soil. And also, I have another question about uh, Cover crops mm -hmm. can can they be counted as a yes? Scenario? We are right now in this watershed. There is a lot of cover crops. Either we use clover or radish to grow, and they are effective. Yeah, they are effective to an extent, but the problem is farmers is more labor for farmers, oh. and they don't have the time. Okay, it's uh, it's also cost, and it doesn't give any economical benefit for. No, them. it's not that much economically, but the farmers willing to accept that. Um, as long as uh, they don't have to do too much management, mm -hmm. like weed management and all this stuff, they don't have the time to make it perfect. If you want to be a very good management, because sometimes these cover crop in it can have a lot of infestation. Yeah, and why a slow release fertilizer is not possible to be implemented? Because you have for herb uh, pesticides with yeah. half-life. Yeah. So why the same scenario cannot be? No, you ca that's what I'm saying. It's not that it's not um, coded right that way now, actually, for fertilizer. It can be coded, but I'm talking about more practicality of mm -hmm. whether it's even practical for the farmers, because once you apply, it's, instead of staying there, it's still going to move, and it's going to end up in the creek, and then it may release the nitrogen after some time. Okay. May not today, but maybe later. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's why we recommend more on applying it under the ground, actually, directly under the ground, close the soil. So that may have better efficiency, actually. Any questions? OK. So once you apply these BMPs, OK, I'm going to show you next set of slides after each BMP, how you see the reduction in phosphorus. OK, I'm just calling. Talking about phosphorus, I'm not doing any nitrogen and uh, uh, sediment here, actually. Um, so this is where the phosphorus is coming from in the watershed from each subbasin. So that's the loading in kilograms per hectare, for example. So the red area are the hot areas where the phosphorus is coming from. So what we do, we run the SWOT model for the baseline. Then we estimate the total phosphorus coming from each subbasin. Then we rank it, which subbasin get the most, 
then apply the BMP based on the recommended thing, actually, like 50% filter strips. Okay? Then we come back and rerun the model again and repeat this over and over again, actually, until we achieve the 35% reduction. So it is an iterative process. Okay? This is just to show you how we did it, actually. It's not that important. So I'm going to skip these slides. Okay? So basically, here is the baseline. This is the, what's currently happening. After I apply the filter strips, the reduction is about 8.3%. Remember, the 50% only we are applying, actually. The sediment is reduced by 8.3%. The phosphorus reduced by 14.2%. And the nitrogen reduced by 9.8%. Then we did the filter strip with the grass waterway, and that increased to 16%. The grass waterway, so this is the grass waterway. This is the great stabilization structure. It's gone up to 17. Then, I forgot what is TR now, actually. So after each BMP, like the wastewater treatment plan, critical planting, prescribed grazing, after adding each of the BMP, we are able to come closer to about 32.8%. or close. And there is also an uncertainty here, actually. This is a long-term mean. In one year, you may have a higher. In another year, you may have a lower. If you don't have a rainfall, no problem, right? No, no sediment, no water quality issues, actually. Okay. So this is what was finally implemented. I'm going to show you this in a map. So this is what's happening in the landscape, and this is what's happening in the channel. Okay. So we implemented all these different BMPs, as I originally said. Um, the same slide I showed you before. Let me get to the real data. So after applying the filter strips, the first BMP, so this is the original map. The color schemes are exactly the same, the same color scheme. So after applying the filter strips, this is the reduction. Okay, so the, some of the reds now starting to turn into orange and yellows, actually. Okay, then after applying the second BMP, so this is, this is where we were, and after applying the second BMP, the third, okay, the fourth BMP. So you can target, so every time we are targeting to the specific subbasin after incrementally applying each BMP. Okay. So after doing all this stuff, we are able to achieve that 35% goal reduction, okay, S slowly by implementing each BMP, actually. Definitely there is an uncertainty. That's why you need to have continuous monitoring just to keep checking is it making an improvement or not, actually. Yep, that's the last slide, actually. So that's basically what we did in this water quality project to achieve the 35% reduction in water uh, total phosphorus goal reaching the lake, actually. Any questions, comments? I have uh, a question. It's a bit yes. out of the scope, but I was curious. How did you find out what the, the farmers were willing to do? How did you make that out? There, was a, there is a strong stakeholder component, actually, where we did not assume that, that's one of the reasons we did not assume that 100% adoption is possible. So that's why we put 50% is the maximum target. In any one BMP, we say, if you can be able to get 50% of the people uh, agree, and especially that is with the low cost, like filter strip is the lowest cost of all. So that's why we put 50% on that. In everything else is not even 20% actually. Okay, but the the assumption we still have an assumption that we are able to convince the most highest uh, problem area to convince to do that. Okay, so we don't know whether we can achieve that actually. Okay, so let's say here is a farmer, here is a farmer, and this farmer produces two times more than this farmer. 
he may not be willing to put the BMP we are recommending, maybe this person is willing to put it, but he's not producing that much sediment and uh, nut I mean, nitrogen and phosphorus, I don't get the result return. Okay? So it is still a consensus building, meaning we need to agree on collectively. So we have a farmers association that we talk to, and uh, they are part of this uh, from, the, from the beginning. Okay? We did not do that outside and then come and tell them, no, you need to fix it. it. They need to be built, they need to be educated, they need to be bring part of the problem because the money is going to come from the city because they are getting drinking water supply. So they are the one who is going to pay these farmers to do certain actions. So that means the farmers have to enter into a contract with them, actually, to manage and maintain and make that happen, actually. Okay? So it is a long-drawn process. It has taken more than six, seven, eight years for them to bring to this day. It's not that overnight it's happened, actually. So this project is over a seven to eight-year period to make to this, this level of understanding, actually. So we have every... Every four months, we have a meeting with the farmers to talk to them about it, actually. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Eu fiquei pensando em relação a esses cenários aí. Tem como dentro do sol de fazer alterações, por exemplo, ele considerou que o regime pluviométrico seguiria, estaria do mesmo jeito, né? E se no caso é, fossem implementadas essas medidas, mas também a gente pensasse numa, num aumento aí das precipitações, visto que, como ele falou, antigamente tinha bem menos do que tem nos últimos anos, né? Teria como fazer ao mesmo tempo esses, essas duas? Simulações. Sim, com certeza. Você pode fazer cenários de BMPs ou de mudança de uso do solo, etc. E também Simultâneo combinar do... mudanças climáticas, por exemplo. <laughs> so she was asking, you did not include for this scenarios any climate change scenarios, sure. right? Sure. But it, it, it's something you could do if yeah, it yeah, was yeah, yeah. something that would, would interest you. Yeah. So, yeah. When we have enough climate variability within this study period, we are, we are studying from 1960 to now. That's almost 60, 70 years of data. Okay. So we are, this is a very, very long-term view in mind. We are not looking at, to, because we are talking about next 100 years. Mm -hmm. okay. So we are not looking at only the last uh, thing. So yeah, we are looking at the variability within the past historic before even introducing anything future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Okay, I will stop right here. And do uh, you want to take it over now, or uh, you got you had a, how much time do you need for your stuff? Actually, do you want to stop and start? Jogger repair, you can do it in thirty minutes, right? Yeah. So just do a jogger repair. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of a project with then a few years back in. Um, a semi-arid basin in the northeast of Brazil. It's the Jaguaribe Basin. Uh, so let me go through here. Um, we have a paper on that uh, that is available uh, right here. Well, yeah, this is the, the link to the paper here. So we continue. So as you know, one of the major challenges in Brazil is to have, uh, well, anywhere, but here too, especially, is to have sufficient data with quantity and quality to run the, the, the model and uh, be able to uh, simulate well the differences in water quantity for here. We were not dealing actually with water quality, as Srini was saying. So what we try to do, uh, we, we aim that modeling one, this Jaguaribe watershed in the northeast of Brazil, and we had a lot of challenges with the weather and precipitation data, okay? So what we try to do is we ran for like four different groups of climate uh, weather entrances and looked at what was the output, which one performed better, 
Okay. So this is the study area. It's in the northeast of Brazil, right here. It's a pretty large watershed, uh, 73,000 uh, square kilometers. Okay. So, and it's almost, uh, yeah, the entire Ceará. And uh, so they have. Mm, uh, major uh, problems because it's a semi-arid watershed dealing with water scarcity and uh, making sure they have available water for water supply and also agriculture. So this was one of the challenges. So it's uh, a little bit old. We did it uh, uh, with ARC SWAT 10 and the ARC uh, SWAT uh, program. Okay. This was all part of a World Bank project that was adapting water resources planning and operation to climate variability and climate change, so both climate variability and change, in uh, two uh, selected basins in the northeast of Brazil. So there were two uh, basins and we were mostly focused on the Jaguaribi one. Okay. So they had a lot of partnerships with the local agencies and local governments and committees, so the watershed committee and all of this. So, okay, we used the SRTM uh, DM database to uh, start delineating the streams and the uh, sub-basins in SWAT. We, did, we had 232 sub-basins. We used the world database for soils. So at that time, we didn't have a lot of time to, to search and, uh, for different data. So we ended up trying the world database information for the texture, organic matter, and soils depth, as I showed you, to you yesterday. So with this data, we applied those pedo transfer functions that I showed yesterday to you with that Excel spreadsheet. And then we, we had all the soil parameters to run the model there. And we used um, a soil, uh, the soil map from Sudeni, so 73 soil map that was available for, that was uh, provided to us by FUNSEMI, which is uh, a Ceará agency, okay? So with this, uh, we also used a land use map from FUNSEMI from 2009, and we also checked what was the um, agricultural production uh, in the state by municipality that is available by IBG, this from Census Agriculture. Uh, so to see what kind of crops were growing, because we only had the major land use um, categories that was like agriculture, agriculture, and forest irrigated agriculture and plantation. So we had only these categories and then we subdivided them or try to see which uh, crops were uh, majorly uh, planted there, so would grow there. So, uh, so these were the, the, the crops that we adopted to use as we decided that based on this uh, data from IBG, so we went and looked in each municipality, what did they grow more? So we have that available now, it's not only for municipality, we have it for smaller areas too, uh, that was released. And you could see what is the production for each crop. Okay, so based on that, we said okay, so they, Usually what was they have more, I don't have all the different, in this presentation I don't have all the percentages, but we checked all the percentages for all the areas and said, okay, they grow more corn and beans in this region. And then they also plain, uh, plant mandioca, mandioca. So, and then uh, sugar cane and cashew. So those were the ones that we adopted. Did you, yeah? Okay, so at the time we didn't have a few of the, the crops in the SWOT database, so we tried something similar. So for example, for uh, cassava, for mandioca, we uh, used potato. So some, some 
uh, limitations on that. So. Uh, so what we did, we ran four different uh, simulations with different climate entrances, so changing the climate input, climatic input. So we had um, daily precipitation from 124 uh, local uh, gauge stations, okay? And what we did, we used this precipitation data with the uh, weather generator data for all the other um, weather uh, parameters, okay? So this was all done based on uh, the statistics of four different airports. We had data from four different airports close to the region. So we used that to do those statistics that we also saw yesterday within the same uh, spreadsheet that I showed. And with that, we ran it with the weather generator, okay? And then uh, the second, because this was the first one that we could run. We did not have, at first, the weather data because InMatch didn't make it available easily at that time. Now it is easier, so you can use it. So at the second uh, scenar scenario here, we actually we had the weather stations from InMatch. So we had 14 uh, weather stations in the region. And then we used those data, that data, with the precipitation data. So this was the second one that we, we chose to use. And then w another thing that we tried, it is the world database that is available through the, the SWOT website too. So this is the CFSR database uh, for all the different climatic data. And here, the fourth one, we use the CFSR, the global database, only for the weather data, not for precipitation. Precipitation, we still use the local rain gauge data. Okay, so this is the four things that we tried out. So these are all the different, um, so these are the four airport stations. There is one here and another here that we used for the weather generator. And then we had all those orange ones are the inmat weather stations. And then we had all the, the precipitation gauge stations here, this, these other ones, okay. Yeah, please. Sure, please. In SWAT, you can provide uh, rain gauges outside the basin. It uses to calculate. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. e well, before in here, what it would take it's the closest rain gauge to the sub basin centroid. Okay, to the sub basin. So one for each sub basin. Now in SWAT Plus, it is assigning the closest one to each HRU. So you can have even more uh, distribution. Yeah spatial distribution. Uh, so we calibrated the model and then this is the available data that we had for stream flow. Those four red dots here is what we had available for stream flow, uh, flow gauges in the region that we, we wanted to use to see how it was performing. Okay. Oh, so this is something that Trini mentioned, uh, something that we tried to. Um, this is the warm-up period for the, wa the watershed. We tried with different years of warm-up pe warm period for all the four uh, scenarios to see because, as Trini said, if it's a semi-arid basin, you may have to have a longer warm period to correctly simulate it, and that's what we find out found out that with what we tried here with five years of warm period, we got better results in for flow. That's what we were checking only. Um, so here are the a few of the statistics. We, we uh, looked at Nash at Cliff, uh, percent bias, and then RSR for each one of the four scenarios, and also trying the three different available um, 
methods to uh, for evapotranspiration in SWOT. So this is Pemon Montif, this is Frizzler Taylor, and this is Hargreaves. In each each one of them. And then um, we try to see, uh, based on a paper that was done by Moriasi, he done a kind of evaluation what could be considered good, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory, or very good, or based on these statistics. So we try to see, based on the statistics, what would be the evaluation according to what he published, what his method. So what we found out, so here we had two of them, the second and the third uh, scenarios were actually unsatisfactory. So our weather data wasn't very good for this region. That's what we found out in this. And then for the fourth uh, scenario, we had satisfactory or very good, depending on the different methods. And mostly on group one, two, we had good and satisfactory, depending on the method, and one unsatisfactory. So again, let me go back here. One, the first one, the, 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 the best overall, overall, sorry, that we found was to use the local rain gauges, so the precipitation data, the local, very more distributed and measured locally, with the global database for the other weather variables. So for this is what we found that was best. Instead of using, for example, the weather stations locally, because for our uh, watershed, we had a lot of missing data for the weather stations, and they weren't, uh, here they are, yeah. And also our statistics for the weather uh, generator were only based on these four uh, airport stations here. So that didn't capture very well. So it was actually better if we didn't have a lot of data for this region. What we found is that it was better to use the CFSR data, the global data for the weather, and then use the precipitation one for the local rain gauges. Uh, and for both cases, actually, only the, the first one that was good too was using those, just the airports and the local rain gauges. So actually what we thought it would be better that was using the weather stations, in this case was not the best option because of all the missing data and some problems maybe they had also with the, the gauges. Mm. So yeah, the, so we also, so what we did here, we analyzed only the flow, so what was the stream flow results based on the different weather inputs, okay? So we didn't actually analyze the different weather inputs between themselves, I don't know how to say this. But, yes, so this is the, uh, the monthly means, for example. So we had the black line as the observed in all of them. So what we saw, this one here, this dotted one, is group three. That is only the world, the global database. So what we found is that it was overestimating precipitation in most of the region there, actually. Okay. But... And then the group four was the, the one that performed better overall. That's the one that we used with the local rain gauges and the global database for the weather input. Yeah, I think that's the main, main, yeah, that's the main point, I think. So I have the statistics also for each group and the methods that we've done for the different analysis. And 
so we found out the importance, I guess, of the warm period and also that to try out different data sets to see which one would be better and which one you can have more confidence in, I guess. And that the, the global database that was done, launched uh, around that year was good uh, to uh, all the weather variables, but not that good for the precipitation, which was better doing with the, the local, uh, local rain gauges but that it could use there. And the, the thing that we didn't uh, predict, that was that the weather stations actually resulted in the worst uh, predictions for this, but mostly because of lack of data, missing data for many of them during that time period that we analyzed. So yeah, for the Jaguaribi one, I think it's mostly this. Let me show uh, let me show another uh, five minutes. I was just going to show the climate change with the same same watershed. If it goes through. So any questions? Do you have any questions? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. <coughs> yeah. Yes, they ask about the if the alterations in the land use scenarios and the mitigation techniques. BPMs, they have to do this on the decision table. So that project was done in the previous SWAT. It yes. was done in the 2000 time period, actually. So it was not using SWAT plus. <coughs> so at that time, we did it directly in the crop, I mean, in the management input file of the. But now you could do it in decision table. With SWAT plus, you will do those BMPs through decision tables. Yes, you can do that. Any more questions? Yeah, in any of the presentations. Uh, for example, in my in my study, I, I studied uh, from 2000, from 1997 to 2006, but I didn't have uh, climate stations mm -hmm. on, in that time from EMAT. Uh, so we, I had only data from 2008 to 2018, so 10 years for climate data. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I did was uh, I used that that data from 2008 to 2018 for climate mm -hmm. for the weather generator. Was it a good idea, or was it would it be better to use the wa the global weather? Well, well, it's um, you had like 10 years. 10 to years use yeah, for the weather daily data generator, of, uh, temperature and everything. Yeah, humidity. that's what Shrini said before. It's better if you have a longer period. <laughs> statistical to represent more drought. Years. Yeah, that's what usually they say the 30 years normal, for example, in mm. Matt usually releases here too. Yeah. For precipitation, I had a lot of data, but data. On only for climate, the temperature. Yeah, but one thing that you could have checked, for example, is to download the, the global uh, data set and see if it was too different for the 10 years that you had and then do you, or like uh, some uh, regression or some mm -hmm. kind of, uh, if it's needed or if it's close enough, <laughs> then you could use it for the past, for example. I think, yeah. I don't know, Srini, do you have, yeah? Yeah. So I don't think I'm, I have much time now. So should I, is the coffee break or should I do this? Okay, so coffee break first, then I'll come back to it. 